Great. So I said we're going to kick today off by discussing some alternative relationships for complex power. And so we're going to get literally all of these just by using following relationships. The first is our general definition of complex power, which is complex power is equal to the product of an RMS phasor voltage and the complex conjugate of an RMS phasor current. And then we're also going to use good old Ohm's law that says that an RMS phasor voltage is simply RMS phasor current times impedance, right? So let's start by saying, so I'm going to have my RMS phasor voltage, and then the complex conjugate of my RMS phasor current is going to look like the complex conjugate of my RMS phasor voltage divided by my impedance. Right? So I'm just rearranging my Ohm's law relationship to express current in terms of voltage, conjugating my current. So that's going to give me RMS phasor current conjugate, or excuse me, RMS phasor voltage conjugate times RMS phasor voltage divided by the conjugate of my impedance. Because when I do the conjugate of a fraction, I should conjugate both the numerator and the denominator. Do any of you guys remember what happens when I multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate? It's not just one. Magnitude squared, right? So let me prove that just really quickly. So if I have a complex number A, that is, let's say, 10 angle A conjugate is 10 angle negative 30 degrees. When I multiply those together, so A conjugate times A is going to look like 10 angle negative 30 times 10 angle positive 30 is going to look like 100 angle zero degrees. This is nothing more than the magnitude of A squared. That will work for literally any complex number. So whenever I have RMS phasor voltage multiplied by the RMS phasor voltage complex conjugate, this looks like the magnitude of my RMS voltage squared divided by the conjugate of my impedance, right? Similarly, I can express V in terms of I um, so that would be I divided by Excuse me, I times Z. So we have a brain, brain part there. Times I conjugate, which looks like I conjugate times I times Z, or the magnitude of my RMS phasor current squared times my impedance, no conjugation or anything on there whatsoever, right? So in these ways, I can find the complex power only by knowing the voltage drop across my element or network or only knowing the current flowing through my element or network. We can go on um, to find complex power relationships for explicitly resistors, capacitors, and inductors, and they will help us understand their role as well. Right? So we 
we know that for a resistor, the impedance of a resistor is simply the resistor value itself. So from this, the complex power absorbed by a resistor is just going to be the magnitude of the voltage squared divided by R or the magnitude of our current squared times R, right? And so effectively, we just get our DC relationships that we got from the very beginning of circuits one, right? V is equal to, or excuse me, the power absorbed by a resistor is V squared over R or the power absorbed by a resistor is I squared times R. Notice that both of these values are purely real, right? We have a magnitude that is purely real, a resistor value that is purely real. So we can say that resistors absorb average power. They do not absorb or supply reactive power in any way, shape, or form. For an inductor, we know that ZL is equal to J omega L, right? So that's going to give us the relationships. The complex power absorbed by an inductor is going to be the magnitude of the voltage squared divided by negative J omega L. Now, what happens when I have a negative J in the denominator? It's going to give us a positive J in the numerator, right? So let me make sure that we're all catching what I'm throwing there, right? So if I have 1 over negative j, and I multiply this by j over j, that's going to look like j divided by negative the square root of negative 1 squared is just j. Are we okay with that? Okay. So in terms of voltage, this is really going to look like positive J times my voltage squared divided by omega L. In terms of current, that's just going to look like J times the magnitude of my current squared times omega L. So in both cases here, our answers are purely imaginary, right? Because there's a J in both terms. Right, so there's no real part whatsoever. And our answer will always be positive, which means inductors absorb reactive power. Isaiah, did you have your hand up a moment ago? Because I take the conjugate of my impedance. So if the impedance of an inductor is J omega L, the conjugate of the impedance of an inductor is negative J omega L because the conjugate operation changes the sign on the imaginary part. Any other questions on the inductor relationship? All right. And then lastly, For a capacitor, we know that the impedance of a capacitor can be expressed as negative J divided by omega C, okay? which is the same as 1 over J omega C, which you may be more familiar with. Right? So from this, the complex power absorbed by a capacitor expressed in terms of the voltage. So we're going to have 
the value of our voltage squared, then we are going to multiply by our, uh, the reciprocal, excuse me, or we're gonna multiply by the conjugate of our impedance. So this is like having negative omega C over negative J. So this negative sign out front comes from the fact that I'm doing the conjugate operation. I have a negative J in the denominator because I'm dividing by this impedance. Um, and this negative J looks like positive J in the numerator, but then there's that other negative sign. So this winds up just being negative J times the magnitude of our voltage squared times omega C. And then I'm gonna do the current relationship down here below it. So now we're just gonna have the magnitude of the current squared multiplied by the impedance. So that'll be negative J times the magnitude of the current squared divided by omega C. In both of these instances, we can see that there is no real part of our complex power and that um, our complex power will always be a negative quantity because there's a negative sign out front. So from this, we can say definitively that capacitors supply reactive power. All righty, so these are the alternative relationships. Just express this way so that we only need to know voltage or current, never both anymore, so that we can be as lazy as humanly possible when analyzing our circuits. Okay. <laughs> All right, so power factor correction. And then this, will, however long this takes, this will be the last thing we're going to talk about today because going from here is filters, which is an entirely different topic, and I don't want to change gears that abruptly in the middle of a class meeting. All right. Okay, so in our last class meeting, we talked about how um, average power was something that we as a consumer pay for, and apparent power was something that the electric utility effectively it costs them to generate, right? So if our power factor ever dipped too low, the electric utility might decide to fine us in order to recoup some of their costs of their losses that they're incurring by generating effectively too much complex power. In order to combat that, um, consumers have come up with a technique called power factor correction, which allows their large scale operations to operate at a power factor that is above the threshold to be getting fined at. So let's look at our power triangle really quickly for an inductive load, right? So this is our imaginary axis up here. This is our real axis down here because the overwhelming majority of industrial loads are inductive. We'll have a power triangle somewhere in the first quadrant. Um, so this I'm gonna call S old and it represents my complex power prior to applying the power factor correction technique. We can see that there is a projection onto the real axis, which we'll call P old, and the projection onto the imaginary axis, we will call Q old. And then we are gonna have this angle here, which I'm gonna call theta old. So my question to you all is, if I want my power factor to increase, do I need to make theta old larger or smaller? Smaller. Absolutely right, right? Um, so there are two ways that I can accomplish this. For those of you that had me in circuits one, we talked about the completely and utterly asinine way of doing it, which is to just make the load draw more average power, so increasing its resistance. 
Um, the problem with that, while it does wind up making our power factor angle smaller, is it's increasing our average power consumption, which is something that we as consumers pay for. So effectively, it's running your utility bill up in order to avoid paying a fine to the utility company, which makes no practical sense whatsoever, right? So throwing that out the window, our only option then is to try to hold our average power constant while reducing the amount of reactive power that we consume. So a situation something like this. So in this case, our average power consumption has stayed the same. This will be Q nu. And this angle will be theta nu. So the smaller angle results in a increase in the power factor at which we're operating. What provides that correction to the power factor? Well, if we want to reduce the amount of reactive power that is being absorbed, it seems like we need to supply some reactive power. And luckily for us, we just found out that capacitors supply reactive power. So effectively, we're going to have to add some capacitance into our system in order to correct the power factor. Okay. So. we can say that the complex power provided by our capacitor is going to be the complex power at our new power factor minus the complex power at our old power factor. And so this is going to look like P old plus J Q new minus P old plus J Q old. So P old minus P old is just zero. And so we're going to have J Q new minus q old and just as a quick note here this quantity is literally always negative so in order to solve for the size of the capacitor to be used in power factor correction, we are effectively going to set this relationship up. Um, this complex power absorbed by a capacitor relationship, and we're gonna set it equal to our relationship over here, which is also the complex power absorbed by a capacitor. In doing so, so if we have J Q nu, minus q old is equal to negative j omega c times the magnitude of our voltage squared, we can rearrange this very easily to find that our capacitance value c is just going to be negative q nu minus q old divided by omega c times the magnitude of the voltage drop across our capacitor. So I'm going to put c down here squared. Now, oftentimes, or at least myself, I'm too lazy to actually calculate q nu and q old. And so instead, I want to put it in terms of my power factor, if at all possible. Um, and so while putting it explicitly in terms of my power factor can look a little ugly, I can put it in terms of my power factor angle pretty easily, right? So this relationship actually comes out to be P old times the tangent 
of theta old minus theta new divided by omega c times the magnitude of our voltage drop across our capacitor. Oops. Where? Yes. Oh, you're 100% right. It definitely shouldn't. It should just be omega. Thank you for that. Yep, 100%. Thank you for that. Capacitance should not be in there twice because that's what we're solving for. Just a total brain fart on my part. Walker. So, as a consumer, it's not something that you would ever actually have to worry about. As a like, and, and so I mean that on like a household level. But if you were working at a plant or something like that, it would very much be something that you would have to worry about. So let's talk about that specifically, okay? So how is this applied, okay? So let's say very basically that I have, because we haven't covered three-phase power yet, let's make everything a single-phase thing, okay? So this black box right here represents a single phase transformer, okay? And these terminals right here are the output terminals of our single phase transformer. So here in the United States at an industrial facility, this might be 480 volts RMS or something like that, right? So let's just put, for the sake of argument, 480 volts RMS. And this is effectively the magnitude of the voltage in our system, okay? This impedance right here, which I'm gonna call ZW is the impedance of our transmission line, okay? So effectively, that's just the length of the wire that's going from the output terminals of our transformer into potentially our electrical panel or something like that. And then over here on the right hand side, we have our industrial load. Probably some combination of induction motors and resistive loads like lights and stuff like that, okay? So the short answer to Walker's question, like this is a very simplified view of things, could be that we can either apply our power factor correction here at the load itself, or we can apply it over here to the transformer. For the overwhelming majority of the time, it's done physically at the transformer. So you will see an object connected to the transformer. That is the power factor correction capacitor bank. Okay. The reason why it's done at the transformer versus at the load is because A, our transmission line is actually going to have some inductance as well, which is going to influence our power factor 
And so correcting our power factor at the transformer takes into account all of the inductance of our load as well as all of the inductance of our transmission line. And B, the loads can change, right? Meaning you might restructure your plant, this, that, and the other. And so having to redo all of that stuff every time you make some amount of change would be a total pain in the ass. Whereas putting a capacitor bank on the transformer side is something that's effectively static throughout the lifetime of your facility. Um, but effectively, all you're doing is you're putting a physically large, usually, capacitor in parallel with your transformer, and it's correcting the power factor of everything that's connected downstream. Physically, it can be quite large. Um, so, I wonder if there's any around here. I can't really see any pole pig transformer. So a pole pig transformer is the type of electrical transformer that we usually see on a utility pole, right? So you know about how large one of those is because you've probably seen them driving around. So you might see a big gray bar next to one of those. That's a capacitor usually. Now on a large scale manufacturing plant or something like that, I mean, the capacitor bank could be maybe a third of the size of this room, but it would be a three-phase thing, and it would be because it's that large because it has to handle a ton of power, right? So capacitors are typically rated um, by voltage, right? So yeah. if you need um, a capacitor that's rated for, let's say, kilovolts of voltage, it's going to be physically larger than a capacitor that's rated for a smaller voltage because you need more space between your plates in order to not have dielectric breakdown across your medium, right? We know that capacitance, or hopefully we know, circuits too, you guys have all hopefully had physics 202 at this point. Capacitance is related to permittivity, cross-sectional area, and the distance between the plates, right? So if we want a large capacitor, we need to either make the plates of the parallel plate capacitor physically very large and the distance uh, between the plates small. If we have a very, very large voltage, there's a fundamental limit to how small we can make that gap because there will be dielectric breakdown, meaning there's only a certain amount of electric field that a dielectric medium can withstand before it accidentally starts to become conductive. Since we are restricted on the distance between our plates, we then have to make everything physically larger to be able to handle that large voltage, which can be done by, it's usually gonna be like a, instead of just one really large plate or, or two really large plates, it's gonna be like a big sandwich kind of thing of capacitors stacked on top of each other, electrically connected in parallel. So something like, here's a plate, here's a dielectric medium, here's another plate, another, same dielectric medium. So, yeah, so like this is the positive polarity terminal and this is the negative polarity terminal. We have twice the capacitance that we would have with um, a single pair of plates, but only one and a half times as much material. So it's cheaper to stack them like that. And then you just layer them like that and make sure exactly like you said that they're connected every other plate so that it looks like they're all in parallel. Yes, sir. So they have, I think I mentioned these like static VAR uh, compensators and all of that kind of stuff they will put in, but as far as like a power factor correction capacitor bank, like that's typically the, the load's responsibility uh, to do that. 
So like that static VAR compensator is literally just a worst case, like we have a take, so they might, uh, the electric utility would do something like that to a company, uh, do something like that for a company like um, Texas Instruments over in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And the reason why they might do that for TI versus a different consumer is because if TI's manufacturing line goes down, it takes them literally days for it to get back running because they're in the semiconductor industry, which means it's costing them literally millions of dollars to restart their line. So it's in the utility company's best interest to make sure that their power never goes out during a blackout kind of thing. So they'll put something in like that. And I'd be willing to bet TI pays a large portion of that installation cost and all that kind of stuff. Whereas for your general Joe Schmo consumer, and I don't mean to be derogatory here, but like a lumber mill or something like that, which chances are some of you guys might go work for, that's probably going to be just the lumber mill's responsibility to install their capacitor bank themselves. They have typically one to maybe three electrical engineers on site whose job is literally just to make sure that their power factor never gets out of whack and to also manage their control systems. Yes. How hard do you think uh, by doing a dedicated on system? Um, I honestly don't know. Most transformers, so like the pole pick transformers, they don't need a dedicated cooling system or anything like that. Um, it's just using the ambient air to keep it cool enough. But like very very large transformers definitely do have integrated cooling. So I'd imagine very large scale power factor correction banks probably also have integrated cooling as well. But the ones that are out on a pole is literally just big gray rectangle out in the air next to the transformer. So it gets as cold as the air gets. Don't touch it. All right. So you guys like want to, I don't know, Throw some numbers at this, or are we good? Okay. All right, so let's say that we have four hundred and eighty angle zero degrees volts RMS voltage here. And then we have a transmission line that has an impedance of 0 0.01 plus J 0 0.005 ohms here. And then let's say over here that I have a motor. Uh, and the impedance of the motor, let's say that it is um, 10 plus J 15. So the first thing um, let's do is figure out what power factor our source is supplying power at. And then once we know that, I'll give us a target to improve to by using power factor correction. So if we want to figure out the power factor at which our source is supplying power in this system, what pieces of information do we need? Um, okay, so if I found the equivalent impedance, which is really easy, how do I use that to get power factor?
so we could find our complex power, but we actually don't need to. That's actually, so I was a bit surprised by the suggestion of using um, the equivalent impedance because it's, we could use this to find the complex power, but we don't have to. So let me explain what I mean by that specifically, right? Our power factor is the cosine of our power factor angle, which is the cosine of theta V minus theta I. Well, as it turns out, the angle of our impedance is also theta V minus theta I. So this is literally just the cosine of theta ZEQ. So I can literally just put that in my calculator. This is where the argument button on your complex math stuff comes out to help you, right? So I'm literally just going to put in cosine of the argument or polar angle of 10.01 plus 15.005i. 15 and I got 0 0.5. Five five five. Would this power factor be leading or lagging? So for us with the TI, you hit second complex, and then the option that says polar angle. That's going to return just the angle of that complex number so that we don't have to bother actually calculating it ourselves because I like to be as lazy slash efficient as possible. Put the complex number. Yeah, the whole damn thing. And it just, so the argument function effectively, all that means is give me the angle of whatever I put in here. So back to my previous question, leading or lagging? Okay, so lagging because the power factor angle is positive. How do you know the power factor angle is positive? I don't have an angle written down anywhere here. Go in complex mode, press the options button, look for something that says ARG. All right, no problem. How do we know that the angle is positive? There is enough information here. The reactance is positive, so the angle is positive. Absolutely correct, Ian, right? So because this is a positive number, we have a lagging power factor. If the reactance was negative, we would have a leading power factor. 100% correct. All right, so this power factor is god-awful, right? 0 0.555 lagging, um, just for the sake of argument. So this is PF old, right? So let's say that we want PF new to be 0 0.90 lagging. And we're trying to figure out what capacitor placed in parallel with our voltage source gets us there. We know that the capacitance is equal to P old times the tangent of theta old minus the tangent of theta nu divided by omega times the magnitude of the voltage drop across our capacitor squared, which reminds me, this is at 60 hertz because I need to tell you that so that we can calculate omega. All right, so what pieces of information do we currently have? Do we have P? Well, we can calculate it. So 
at this exact moment in time, the only number that we have to put into this equation specifically is VC, 480 volts. Literally everything else still needs to be determined. Now we've done a lot of the legwork for all of that other stuff, right? So let me just note here, the magnitude of VC, 480 volts RMS, one thing down. Let's figure out the next lowest hanging fruit. Omega is two pi F, so that's gonna be 120 pi radians per second. So we've got our denominator figured out, okay? We just found out what PF old is, so I would argue that that should allow us to determine theta old pretty easily, right? So theta old is going to be the inverse cosine of our old power factor. And because our old power factor was lagging, I'm just gonna put a positive sign out here to remind us that this angle is supposed to be positive. So the inverse cosine of my previous answer is 56.292 and some change degrees, and I'm gonna store that as X. We can find theta nu the same way, right? And once again, because our target power factor is lagging, we're gonna have a positive angle, so positive the inverse cosine PF nu is gonna come out to be 0 0.9, 25.842 and some change degrees. And I'm storing this in my calculator as Y. So now the only thing that we don't know is P old. So any thoughts on how we might solve for that? And I would prefer the laziest way possible. So we can use the real part of the impedance. How are we going to use the real part of the impedance to calculate fields? Yep, absolutely right. So based on what we have, P old will literally just be the magnitude of our voltage squared divided by our equivalent resistance. So 480 squared divided by 10.01 gives me 23.017 kilowatts. So this is one big honking motor. Okay. Storing that in my calculator as Z, we now have all of the uh, excuse me, we now have all of the different parts that go into our equation. Isaiah, you were raising your hand. Fantastic question. So let's let's work things out, right? So we know that the complex power absorbed by a generic impedance can be expressed as the magnitude of the voltage squared divided by the conjugate of the impedance. So let's say that, um, let me put this up here. Z is equal to R plus JX, like so. So this would be the magnitude of our voltage squared divided by R minus JX where that R minus JX represents the conjugate of my impedance. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply by R plus JX over R plus JX. 
And so this is going to give me the magnitude of my voltage squared times R divided by R squared plus X squared plus the magnitude of my voltage squared times, so there should be a J out front here, X over R squared plus X squared. That's 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 right. Let me let me do this through just to, to double check here. So R times R looks like R squared. Then I have R times J X. So plus J X R minus J X R. And then negative J times positive J comes out to be positive one. So plus X squared. So no, that's that's correct. Why does that come out being just B squared over R? Because it should. Let me see something real quick here. Oh, definitely gave me a different number. The resistance should contribute the real part of the power, but I'm kind of um, stuck at the moment in deriving exactly why that works. So... Let me just plug in our basic numbers into this relationship right here and then express it in rectangular form and see what shakes out. So that would be 480 volts RMS squared divided by 10.01 minus J 15.005 ohms, right? So 480 squared divided by 10.01 minus 15.005 gives me, oh, damn, 7.088 plus J. 10.625 VA, which is the exact same answer I got using this expression right here. So that apparently is not correct. And I just thought it was going to work out that way. Okay. I'll have to look into that more. Isaiah, thank you for your question. 
so now that we have all of our numbers, we can literally just plug stuff in, right? So I stored this in my calculator as Z. Um, so I'm going to have Z times the tangent of X minus the tangent of Y divided by 120 pi times 480 squared. And I get C to be... 82.81 microfarads. Yes, sir. Four hundred and eighty squared divided by ten point zero one minus fifteen point zero zero five I. I got seven thousand eighty eight point six eight and some change plus one oh six two five point nine four yada yada yada. Hold on, let me go AVA. Oh. Okay. And then I used stuff to solve for C. The equation, just put it all in there. All right, we got 20 minutes left. What else do you guys want to talk about? A friend on Amazon um, got this AC power cord that had both panel and solar right on each side. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible, terrible thing to use. Wildly dangerous. So let me explain why that cord exists for idiots to use uh, and i hope i am recording this actually that cord exists for idiots to use um, so that they can effectively plug one end of that cord into an electrical generator and the other end of it into an outlet in their home during the event of a blackout and so effectively what it does is it use the, uses the generator to feed electricity to your home's circuit panel um, in the event of a power on. The problem with that is if you don't go through and manually disconnect your main breaker from the rest of the grid, you can potentially kill a worker who's working on trying to get service back up for the rest of the neighborhood. So I repeat that cord is for idiots, selfish idiots to use to establish electricity in their home in the event of a blackout. Do not buy one. Call anyone that you ever see that owns one of them a moron. So what if you just have a temporary, like what if you have a portable generator because you don't have a whole home generator installed? It's just a way for people that don't know enough about electricity to be dangerously lazy. Yeah, it's literally just one switch, but there's nothing that's going to force you to do that. So if you're smart and you disconnect your, if you 
shut off your main breaker so that your house's circuit is disconnected from the grid at large, that will only impact your home. But if you don't do that, because you didn't think about it, you forgot or whatever, you can literally potentially kill somebody who's trying to work on getting electricity back in your neighborhood. So it is a terrible, terrible product that literally should be banned in the United States and everywhere else. So anyway. So realistically, like a portable generator is meant to run an extension cord and then you plug like your refrigerator and maybe one or two other appliances up full story it should not be used to power your entire home they don't come in sizes that are appropriate to power your entire home anyway yeah, like, and careful about how much you're putting inside how much that's how sure yeah Still a terrible idea. So we're not so we're not feeling What if you plug the to an outlet and then the other end into another outlet in your home? You would short things out, probably cause a fire. Also really stupid. Yes. Sorry, yes, I made a thank you for that. This should be tangent theta old minus tangent theta new. Thank you for that. That was a mistake. 